Welcome back to Double DG Business, and I'm here with... Debbie Halls Evans. You've been here before, haven't you, Debbie? Yeah. <laughs> is this a double take? Is this, this the is second start of the podcast? Very rarely today? happens. It, it is very rare. Who do we have with us today, Debbie? We have Rebecca Hartley from Serving Grace Events, and I've just allowed myself to introduce her. Rebecca, do you want to tell us what Serving Grace Events do and why it exists? Uh, yeah, so, well, Safe and Grace Events, we're a full service events agency, so that means we help businesses design and deliver events and experiences. Um, we work with businesses essentially that want to engage either their clients or their employees, um, and we exist to be their saving grace. So we take care of everything from for them from beginning to end, we take the hassle out of running events and we do it spectacularly. You if do. I can say so myself. <laughs> no, well, I can also say, and Dave can say that, and my girls can say that, because we've all experienced one or more of your events, so which is awesome. And it is. I think it's a, a very unique industry for a start. And what got you into it? Why did you start it? Um. Well, there's a short and a long answer to that. So, um, <laughs> I mean, I've been interested in events since for as long as I can remember. So I always retell a tale that actually only occurred to me maybe four or five years ago um, when I was seven years old and I organised my first event. So I, um, I organised a surprise party for my parents. I phoned friends and relatives in secret, spent my pocket money on cakes and balloons at the corner shop. Um, and invited everybody around and had a party <laughs> so it was always in me um, I didn't always pay attention to it it was always in me and I was always the party planner um, about eight years ago I started to do um, events slightly more professionally so I started with charity events yeah. um, and I did those annually both um, both on my own and also with a couple of committees that I've been involved in for breast cancer charities um, and just just realized that it was a real passion um, coincidentally, I, after getting involved with a couple of breast cancer charities, I then myself got breast cancer, which led me on a whole journey. But when I came back to work full time, I just realised that I just didn't want to be A, in the culture I was working in and B, in the industry I was working in, um, or the role, um, which prompted the question, well, what do you want to do? Yeah. Um, and through a, a fairly, fairly, um, a fairly long journey <laughs> I came back to events again so it started off as a slightly different proposition of which events was part of it um, and I soon realized that actually that was just where my passion was and that's where I needed to focus my attentions and since since that we've gone from um, we've grown exponentially which is awesome why Dave's just nodding at me Rebecca I know you're in the zone and it's always nice to see you on double D do business when you're in your place of floor and, and I quite enjoy it. So carry on doing it. It's because I enjoy what Rebecca does, you see, and I, I, it fascinates me because... You're not vying for a transfer, are you? No, <laughs> well, you never know. After lockdown. <laughs> yeah, after lockdown. No, I think what fascinates me is, well, there's, I've got a million questions, but I haven't got a million because that'd be extreme, wouldn't it? It'd be a pretty big I've got several questions. I think one of the things the laws we can talk about and I think well, I also just want to make sure because if I say this out loud Dave will remember to bring us back um, is how you transition from being a live event which you've been doing successfully for so long globally uh, taking clients out of the country and experiencing it but how we've transitioned that and also a bit about the partnership that we have tested very recently but what what my first question is and I this has triggered it when you just said it then about going from a passion and something that you really love doing and turn it into a business because I did that and I hated it uh, I opened the deli and I love cooking and I still love cooking uh, but it was the worst decision I ever made because I suddenly realized that I enjoyed it under my own terms and therefore it wasn't a passion, it was just something I enjoyed. How do you how do you distinct the two from you're really passionate about eventing and making it a successful business? Before you answer Rebecca, uh, we like to pay a bit of linguistic police in oh, double DG business, you said how do you distinct? I think what you meant was distinguish, is that correct? No, same how thing. Do you, how do you distinguish? Uh, anyway, uh, there you go. Rebecca, over to anyway, you. Anyway. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I think actually for me it's worked, it's worked slightly the other way. Um, 
so I haven't I haven't lost my passion for it yeah. but I probably have lost my passion for it slightly in my personal life <laughs> <laughs> where I was always be the one organizing parties don't want to do yeah. my own parties anymore kind of for that in my own work time um but yeah I mean I suppose you never know do you until you until you make that leap yeah. but I think for me it's um the business is is great because it is something I'm passionate about, and you know there are parts that I love about it. There are parts that everybody doesn't love about their business, and they're just housekeeping. But I love the creativity. I love you know coming up with ideas, selling that to a client, them loving it, and then bringing that to life. I love the day of the event. I love the chaos of it. I love the pressure of it. Um, and I love seeing it all come together. And then the ultimate thing is that I just love to see people enjoying themselves with like huge smiles on their faces. And, you know, that's the ultimate reward really that you've created something that people have valued, enjoyed and benefit, benefited from. Um, but then what I've also realized is that it's not just about the events. I actually love the process of business as well um, because I'm learning so much. And I think that started before I took the decision to have my own business. Um, I worked for Virgin Media yes. and was brought in to set up a customer experience function within their sales channels. And it didn't exist um, at that time. And, and you would think that a company like Virgin Media would have been a lot more advanced than they were at that point, but they didn't even have things like call recording to capture their customer interactions. Um, so it really was starting from a baseline. And this was a, this was a role that I'd been in previously, an outsourcing company. So I came in with a blank piece of paper, really. They knew they wanted to put call recording in, but in terms of um, delivering exceptional customer experiences outside of their amazing brand, they didn't really have a strategy for what they wanted to do. So I had a blank piece of paper. I created the strategy, I created the team. Um, and I really, it was almost like a mini business within Virgin Media. No one really, nobody knew more than I knew. So nobody kind of told me what to do or, yeah. They called me to account, so there was accountability there to deliver. Um, but you know, we did a, some amazing transformational pieces in terms of looking at what drove customer experience and all the elements of that, which linked into employee experience, as do events. Um, so that gave, that gave me, um, I suppose, a bit of a bug for managing my own business. Yeah. And then, you know, when I then went on to another business and I was part of a cog, albeit in a director role. I just realized that I wanted to be I wanted to be doing something where I was in full control, where I could create what I wanted to create and the culture that I wanted to create yeah. and kind of make my own rules and live or die by my own sword. I think that's amazing. And I think George really, I suppose each event is also a mini business experience, isn't yeah, it? Because it is. you're working with a different client every time. I know you've got a repeat business as well, but it is a different experience. Dave spoke about this week in um, some of our social media about positive memories. And one of the things that we were talking about, particularly right now in COVID, is that we need to be stimulated by positive memories yeah. and create memories. And that's, that's ultimately what you do as well, which is, I think that's what fascinates me about it because it's it's like my horror is is the logistics of organizing other people and releasing control to it to a big massive event i think yeah. that would be my my horror so i think it's fascinating you enjoy that side of it of just allowing things to happen chaos and, you, and, and anyone listening to this must go on saving grace events as well oh yeah it's brilliant on the social media which we'll put in the trail afterwards of some of the great video reels you have of some of the super work you've done and, and I think, Debbie, it is a unique thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To care about all the worries of the planner person. Yeah, it's Or the intense. person making the order or the business doing the event um, is, a, is a gift. Yeah, I mean, you're right, you're right. Every, every event is different, every client is different. All of our solutions are bespoke for that reason. Um, and that's one of my favorite bits, being able to, you know, sit, we never ever, you know, people will phone up and say, can you give us a quote for this? We can't. Yeah. That's, you know, similar to your, your world, really, um, in that we, you know, we really get to know that client, whether it's a private client or a charity or a corporate and understand them as a brand, um, but also understand what they're, what they need from that. And their needs can be very different as it could be that somebody literally wants to show off the most fabulous party ever and come out of it looking like the greatest party um, yep. organizer ever, or it could be, you know, fundraising for a charity or raising the profile of a business or rewarding and recognizing or communicating messages so they're, they're all so different 
um, but that's what that's what makes it interesting. And what's I know I'm sure everybody asks you the same question, but do you have a favourite event? Are you allowed to say that, or is that going to is that client based? No, it's just the RLC virtual event, I mean, Surely, it's <laughs> to be, hasn't it? Working with us, it's very different. We're in a virtual event. Well, as he's brought it up, let's talk about where we're at now. So we know openly that the social distancing, therefore, that has a direct impact on your business around events because not collectively we cannot go all together so what what have you done and how are you doing it yeah so i mean obviously th- this this point in time is is difficult for the events industry there are no live events happening yeah. and there are no live events guaranteed to happen in the immediate future but yet people still need to um people still need to or businesses in particular still need to be able to communicate with their employees and their clients they still need to be able to um keep people on board and create that camaraderie and also to educate and to deliver messages so um the challenge is how to flip that into a virtual world and i think the project that we've been working with you on was the perfect start point really because your brief was that you wanted to create an event online and not a webinar yeah Um, and i think that's that was really important to your audience and also gave us a great opportunity to be really creative as well um, and to make those events interactive and funnily enough i had um i've had an inquiry today about another virtual event um, and then their, their goal is the same really, they want to do something that's that's interactive and that, that works virtually. Um, I mean, there's pros and cons of, of virtual events versus live events and there's yeah. some benefits to virtual events in their own right. Um, but they they are historically two very different things, so it's, it's bringing them to life. Well, and I think that's the difference is they'll never be the same. You, you, you know, a, a collection of people in a room celebrating, you can create energy virtually. I genuinely do believe that collectively, but it's a very different experience. But I think that's what it is. It's the experience of an event. And I think the reason why my brief to you was really clear is I do not want to experience a webinar <laughs> again. Um, the monotony and the, the this kind of regurgitated process and I think that's for me is really important is that what we've created is something that is now evolving and we've got to be ahead of innovation and technology and interactivity and engagement I know we've done it lots of different ways it's a great it's a great format I I love I love the fact that if you look at this through the lens of a business owner right that one of the number one tasks of a business owner is to share the vision or the story of their company in as many ways as you can until people tell you the story back mm-hmm. you know that's the bit a lot of us forget about it. it's not just the story in the moment it's the story till somebody tells you the story better than you in your own team that's when you can start thinking about do you hand on that torch to somebody else to tell that story from now on virtual events give business owners and big leaders in big brands and corporate companies with saving grace events to put on an event where you can still do that critical activity no matter what's going on with COVID, because we have digital technology at our fingertips today that 10 years ago we would never have imagined, right? Um, <laughs> that allows us to do some incredible things. Well, I also think there's a, the bit for me is, my head, and because our virtual event was about this, uh, was about post-COVID. Yeah. And I and I have because so many things will and in my head. But one of them is how you know the world will be different. How different? I'm not certain. But for example, for us at RLC, is you know the amount of transatlantic flights will probably be less because of travel and the way that the aviation uh, and uh, hospitality side of it will take longer to recover I think so that therefore means we've still got to be ahead of the curve we've still got to be able to engage people differently and virtually I think people will be more cost driven they've now you know got estates of people that are working from home saving a lot of money you know people are saving a lot of money Oh, and I'm aware that there is another side yeah, of furlough and reduction yeah, of money. Well, that's not that. It's the, the oil industry, which has a uh, feast of famine, well, yeah. see, is, uh, is costing more uh, to actually produce the oil. Because uh, there's nobody buying it. Because there's nobody buying it. And yeah. all the storage facilities around the world are full. So there's nowhere for it to go. There are big tankers doing a figure eight, I read about today, really? in the sea, right? Because there's nowhere for them to go to take the oil. So, so in this, like any situation, there's disaster and there's joy, yet the problem is still the same, the need's the same. 
mm-hmm. not to doing an event, not staying connected. Because one of the things that I've picked up around the world over the last few weeks is employers have taken the, the latch off to someone who's furloughed due to the legal restriction. They're not saying hello because it's considered yeah, yeah, you know, true. personal contact. But actually, I think, personally, Dave's you, yeah. it's a mistake. You should be able to furlough and I should be able to bring you and say, you're all right, because this is... This is no longer a, 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 just a, a furlough new contractually. This is an international, global crisis. Therefore, me saying that you are right should not have anything to do, even an email, with your work. But of course, with that type of opinion, comes with all the risks that opens up of people then would abuse that opportunity. And some companies will do, yeah. So, but nonetheless, staying connected leads us back to in your line of work, Rebecca, I think it's vital for big CEOs, uh, you know, boards of companies, small or large, it doesn't matter, thinking about doing events, like Tammy from our team is going to be doing, to connect with their people and to stay connected and to show that you care. Because let's go back to the other thing you said, Debbie. People are going to have a whole range of emotions. Yep. Stepping back into a traditional working arena. We're going to help people do that. And again, whilst we're in that interim phase, why not put on a different type of event as many times as you can? Because that's the other advantage, Rebecca, is that there's no limit to how much you can do other than schedule, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, and it which, one of the benefits of virtual events, and I've just written a, um, a blog on this actually um, for our social media, but um, is that you it opens it up the flexibility is there much more so if you had an an event in london on a thursday afternoon you certainly couldn't do anything else probably on the even the 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 wednesday the wednesday setting up um whereas with a virtual event it's much easier to get people together and to and to organize it because you you don't need to physically logistically move around yeah and also the, the, there is a, an opportunity is it is cost effective there is you can't disguise that i mean you can make it expensive um and you can add lots of different elements to it but there is a cost effective you know to hire a site hire uh, uh, different people around getting tr- people to travel there is also but i think it has to be in balance i see that it's that they're in yeah. there's they come together that's how i see it I, I think you can't just have one without the other yeah. i think there's got to be a balance in you know, we have our annual event, but actually all our other events are virtual or, you know, we yeah, have- It's a new blend, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and I think, oh, we have, you know, one massive virtual event and every other is personal when they can be. So I think it's a balance. I don't, I think the, the sway is just getting that balance right, isn't it, for people? Yeah, and I think also, um, you know, for a, there's different types of businesses that will need to do different types of things and yeah. definitely having conversations with businesses who want to have an interim solution and then want to have a solution for when we're fully out of yeah. this but they might also want to consider how that how they how they do events full stop moving forward given the learnings during COVID-19 but then you've also got businesses like yours who aren't just running events for their internal people they're also running events for clients and virtual events what what that also allows you to do is to pass on that cost saving and make your event more accessible to a wider audience and i think that's also something that can be that's got longevity as well as be, in being part of the overall proposition so it's almost it can almost become an entry point um proposition for for coaching businesses for example um who for clients who otherwise wouldn't be able to access that kind of live event one you know small yeah. group um content because it would be out of their price range you know particularly for small businesses for example yeah i agree i think i i, I got really excited because when it when it's come together and i know we've got several more um, but when it's when it came yes, together, several more what, oh, several more events, virtual events, ROC so, virtual, COVID nineteen post recovery. Start your recovery plan with yeah. ROC. As you can tell, Dale's Dave is a salesperson. <laughs> it's not. It's not part of my remit. I should actually. I think it's brand custodian. Is it brand custo- yeah, custodian? Yeah, what we're doing. That's very yeah. true. Yes. Uh, well, that is that highlights exactly what I then do. I am like a, a a spider where I just cast my web over absolutely everything and then keep just going up and down, and <laughs> traveling around. Spinning about, spinning about. That's exactly yeah. what I do. Yeah. <laughs> I, 
I, I, I'm excited too because we we were really encouraged by there was another big learning for RLC with, with Rebecca and Saving Grace events, and that was it shone through that we don't discriminate, uh, we don't make any differences to, we don't pay attention to all the things that the world preaches about. So we took a group of people from all walks of life, shapes and sizes, from all types of rank, mm -hmm. and put an event on. And they all connected, and it didn't matter what they did during the day. And they came together, and they really did connect up with what we were teaching. So the content overruled the point yeah, of difference. That's true. Content is always king, uh, isn't and it? I, and I have to say, I, I was really excited to see that feedback coming back in. And it didn't matter whether you were Callum Stewart uh, early in his career, or you, or you were the marvellous Dr. Lee Valens, right? It didn't make a difference who you were in those rooms. People had great conversations and it was nice to see. Well, that's the similarity, isn't it? Because if you didn't have great content in a live event, yeah. well, the, true, yeah. the event wouldn't yeah. work either, would it? So it yeah. is, you know, the content is, and maybe that's what the difference is, the strength of quality of content versus that experience of I've just been through a webinar, yeah. is I've actually experienced something. And I think that was the difference. And getting people to talk, you know, there's, there's not 150 people um, on the particular events that we're running right now because we want the intimacy and we want the intentional action and, and building of conversation. So yeah, yeah, that was quite a good sales pitch. With virtual events, I think, um, which is exactly what you and I have done um, on this, is that you've just you've almost got to think through the flow and the content and the experience even more. Um, because in a live environment, some things are kind of assumed. You can quite easily create atmosphere. People can see things, they can hear things, they can smell things. Yeah. Um, and they've got, you know, the, just the energy within the room. So um, you've got to try and create that. Um, it's much more difficult to do it. So you've, you've almost got to think that process through more than you would with a live event. Um, but yet you're restricted by fewer things potentially that you can do. But it, you know, that's the challenge of it, isn't it? That's, that's the fun of it. You've just made my brain go and think about the next event. But I'll tell you about that one off, off, uh, off, off podcast. Because yeah. I've just thought of something really cool. Um, all right, so for me, um, I just want to make sure that people understand why we brought you on. Because the other thing that you have been doing on your social media, which Dave and I have loved, uh, and it's not our normal thing, is you've been interviewing some fabulous people. And you've been doing it live. On Instagram. Uh, on Instagram, and it's been and bought, flipping marvellous. Yeah, and we bought um, a mat as well. But yeah, so tell us about how that idea as well, because that's it is another event ultimately. And before yeah. you watch, I have to say, I, I watched Martin and Fires, uh, who's one of Rebecca's guests. Yes. I, I watched while, while you were doing your talk, and I, I reminded myself of some of his tribe, and I have to say, I watched, I watched the show reel. I forgot how bloody good he really was. <laughs> yeah. And, and, it was, and, and, and what, is he, what is he feeding himself? Because he did not look as old as he told us to. I know, I know. Ridiculous. Um, yeah. I mean, well, Martin's a good friend of mine, so it was, a, it was an interesting experience for me because, you know, I've, I've got a couple of his books here, which I have to say I haven't actually read. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I could have learned a lot more about his career. But you don't really go into detail with any of your friends around what well, they've done for their whole career, do you? So it was it was actually I was genuinely asking a lot of the questions because I didn't I didn't know the answers to them. Um, but yeah, so how how it came about was. Um, I, fundamentally for me, I believe that business is a spiritual business. Um, it should be a spiritual thing and that's how I work in life and in business. Um, and I think the kind of um, the values and the ethics of Saving Grace events kind of represent that. Yeah. Um, so I'm all about connection and that kind of sh shines through in the work that we do as well. Um, and I think what we, what I wanted to achieve with those with the, those um, those lives was to inspire people. So there was a lot of talk around mental health and um, managing your mental health. And actually, I was due to to talk at Virgin Media about um, about mental health just before this kind of all kicked off. Um, so that was that was in my mind anyway. 
but particularly during COVID-19 situation where everybody's stuck at home, um, it kind of seemed to link well. So I, we wanted to bring some ins people, five days, five guests, five inspirational stories, um, A, to entertain people, again, doing them as kind of positioned as an online event, yeah. um, but also to, to talk about some really great stories where people had either had to develop a winning mindset, manage their mindset, battle adversity, um, uh, but, but had success and you know positive results at the end of it in the hope that that would inspire um, our clients, our followers, our friends, etc. So that's kind of where it came from. So we interviewed, as you know, we had five guests, one of whom we've still got to interview because unfortunately it wasn't well, but some just uh, incredible stories, sporting stories like Martin Fires through to um, ex-footballer Joe Thompson who battled cancer twice to um, Davinia Taylor who was an actress who's battled alcoholism and is now a health and fitness guru um, a local businesswoman Karina Jadhav who runs a restaurant in Manchester and has run multiple restaurants in Manchester who's got a great woman in business story um, so yeah again I was indulging a bit of a passion of mine because I'm a huge Oprah Winfrey fan I love those <laughs> super -soul conversations so I throw for a while and I've, I've actually got a book over there that I've been reading in the sun today um, but for a while I've been want, I've been toying with the idea of bringing together a selection of inspirational stories because I'm really motivated and inspired by that kind of thing. Um, so it was just the perfect opportunity to do it. Yeah, I thought they were great. And I've, I've never, I, my, my gambit today was, I don't know how to watch these things, Dave, because I get bored. And we were both like, this is really good. And yeah, we actually but, watched it all the way through. Yeah, we, we were fascinated to ourselves. There's two things we were doing. So Martin was the, was the first example of, listened to what he had to say, check what he was saying, watch what he did. Yeah. Right? So yeah. That, that was me. And then is it Davinia? Davinia, she was yeah. fantastic. And I must say, I really like her attitude. Yeah. It's really refreshing. Um, but then she was mentioning things. And we were like, okay, wonder what that is. <laughs> so we were there, we were so yeah, well. there should have been some assisted sales for some of this stuff because um um I'm going like this, going, oh, I could do some of that. Uh, and we, we bought stuff on the back of it. So we didn't listen to her with any intention of doing that. That's the impact of what she was doing, isn't it? So it did what you wanted it to do. And I think, and, and I suppose that that is the next spin off. Sorry, I'll get my words there eventually. But that is the next spin off. A virtual event creates these wider opportunities, doesn't it? Because that connectivity, that connection that you said is really important and is a, a massive value of, of Saving Grace events as well, is it's just a different way of doing it. So whether it's connecting to products or services or uh, connecting within the event and outside of the event, your experience is different. But I've got, you know, we did it in hours. We actually use a different service that we've never used before. And people were using their phones to interact live yeah, yeah, with the yeah. screens. I mean, it was awesome. So I think there's- and that was a hit as well, so. Yeah, and it's, it's great. I mean, there's quite a few of them I found out that I didn't realize, but it's the first time I've ever experienced it. But anyway, by the by. So shall we bought the first one again? No, 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 we didn't. Um, so just for me, it's about, it's that, there's a guided experience. And then there's the, the kind of that natural experience that goes off. Dave's experience particularly is you go off and you do something else but you're still highly engaged and I think that's where we've got to get better at understanding why people do that in virtual events and how do you keep that momentum going because it's boring sitting on your backside if you're not watching somebody on stage or you know there's an event going on or you've got a dinner or yeah, you know but I, it's... But I, I, but I think it's okay to we were talking to a client recently about you know people working at home and um, and there was a conversation played back to me that went a bit like this. You know, people set off with COVID saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to sort that out, I'm going to take care of that, I'm going to plan that. And what COVID's also isolated, Debbie, and apologies to the listeners in advance, humans are lazy, Yeah. right? So, <laughs> so let, let's be clear about this. There are those that do and those that talk about doing. So, and it's okay to draw that really clean line, right? So. I, th I think you, you can say that, but if you're going to turn up at an event online or in person, show up like you mean it. So you can't cater for people who just don't want to do that. And if they are there, that's so be it. If it's a live event within a company or a live event, that's open market. But if, if you're going to show up on a, on a virtual event, you owe it to yourself to tune in and you owe it to yourself to self-manage yourself better than you would in any other circumstance. Otherwise, go watch the TV you'll get more out of it. 
Yeah, I think I think different types of events, no different to the virtual events I present different problems. So if you are running a public event and somebody has paid to be there, be that a, you know, sporting event like the boxing event, the attending VIP event that we do, or be that a charity event, um, charity lunch or dinner, then you've paid to be there unless you're on somebody else's table, which people quite often are. But generally you've paid to be there. So you're already predisposed to being engaged in the content, uh, which doesn't make the challenge any less great in terms of making it spectacular and engaging. Um, if you are at a business event where you're expected to be there i think it does um it makes it all the more important that you engage people because they don't necessarily they haven't necessarily opted to be there or want to be there and particularly when people get into that lull at home um, which is why the event that we did together, you know, made that again that connection and that interactivity and um, that element of surprise. So putting things in there that you know they're expecting to turn up, they're expecting it's going to be a webinar, they're expecting to be spoken to, they're expecting to be played some presentations. Um, but are they expect are they expecting to do some fun interactive things? Are they expecting to use tools that they've never seen before? Are they expecting the video content and the music and the drinks reception afterwards? Are they expecting to be surprised with things before during and after the event and um you know that it's they're the they're the key things really no, that's no different really to a live event to a virtual event but um yeah i do think i do think you know i i personally i'm the most self-critical person ever but regardless if it, if they were supposed to be there and supposed to be engaged if they weren't i would see that as a failure on our, on our part yeah, i agree i and i'm exactly the same and i think that's I also think that's by being self-employed, no discredit to anybody who's employed, but I have been an employee for many years previously. But I do think you have a higher pride value that goes with this is our product, these are our services, this is us, I, I am presenting us to yeah, you. Your, your brand is on the line. Well, I don't think it's even brand to me. I know I realise that brand's significant, but it's actually how you feel about what you're doing. Yeah. Is I think it's much more intimately connected. So you do, uh, you know, the distinction between personal and professional can get blurred because you want it to be right and you want to add value. Which I've got two more questions. I don't know what time we're on, but I've got two questions. So I, I picked up on what you said about challenges, and I think this is really fascinating. So the challenges that come out of running a virtual event versus a live event, and not necessarily um, need to be answered, but I think it's things for us to consider. Should we always have paid events or free events? And I know I highlighted to you, I've signed up to maybe 20 or 30 webinars and probably turned up to 50% of them. Yeah. They were all free. Um, ours is a paid event and we genuinely believe that we're doing that because of the content, the value and the impact that that can have on somebody. Ultimately, they're paying for a coaching session very cheaply. Um, so I think that's a big question, isn't it? Do I, and, and now people are saying, you know, we shouldn't be buying services and stuff. Why not? It's an investment in your future. Yeah, and do you know what? A free event, unless it leads to something else, doesn't have any longevity. Yeah. Um, because you can't, if you're putting an event on for free, how can you, you know, it's the same as a ticket price for a live event. How can you deliver that wow factor if you're working with nothing? Um, unless you've got really deep pockets. So I think, and, and secondly, back to your point, people don't value something that's free as much. So you're kind of saying that if, you know, if it's free then, and this is not, you know, there's, there is loads of value in free events, yeah. uh, but there's no, but they can't be delivered forever. They can't be delivered on an ongoing basis. So if a, an event that was being run regularly was always free, then you'd have to ask yourself, how much value can there be in it um, I agree with that. But I, George, yeah. George, George Paris said something really interesting the other day from Bowers Accounting and, and Consulting in Syracuse. He said, when I go to a free event, I was always told, put your event away. Sorry, put your wallet away, he said. Because <laughs> he, he said, if it's free, they're going to get the cash somewhere else. Mm, yeah. Right, so that was George's take on it. Which I thought it was quite interesting. never heard that before. Um, <laughs> But George doesn't talk like that just for anybody. And George, I do apologise because that didn't sound anything like you either. No, it didn't. But for your type of event, you're adding such value. Yeah. And that has to be valued. You have to want that value. 
but we know that in our industry coaching and, and consulting you know the it there's variable prices out there and everybody's got something that they want to present anybody ultimately can be a coach or consultant doesn't mean they're good at it but anybody can be but i think the difference for me is is ensuring that at the end of it somebody says i can use that and that's really good i'm going to have that that's made me deal with this better and we, you know, we got that feedback, um, and I think that's that gives me genuine what pride. Was your second question? Oh no! So my other challenges yeah. was percentage of no shows live versus virtual, and I know we've no facts, but I think it'd be really interesting to see that the difference for future business as well, and evolving that. And then actually, how do you truthfully measure engagement or not? This is a completely different podcast because I could, and you know from customer experience, is that people will tell you one thing and actually maybe have experienced something completely different. So I think there's another big question in how do you ensure that what you get is fact um, and something you can work with for the future. Anyway, that was my question. Was a good question. So let, let's, <clears throat> let's bring this back around to, as we draw this towards a nice conclusion today, uh, well done. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Rebecca, if there's one message or advertising that you'd like to make sure, I know, isn't it just, uh, that you'd like to make sure the listeners remember about Saving Grace events, what would that be? Oh, Dave. <laughs> Let's, first, finish, so let's finish on a really difficult <laughs> question. Yeah. yeah, and you didn't pre- you didn't even ask yeah, us about that. So, so uh, believe that their answer was oh Dave. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> thanks, Rebecca. Uh, but so I, I, I should have really thought about that. But I think if you're running an event and you're listening to this, wherever you are in the world, you should be speaking to Rebecca and saying so yeah. I mean the I love the fact you take the pain out of doing them. And you, you're committed to joy and making them memorable and delivering a world class experience. So, so go on, Rebecca, you were going to say something. Yeah, well, some of what Dave, some of what Dave said, really. So, um, you know, we we work in true partnership with our clients, and our clients are varied. So, you know, we do do international events. We do work with corporates like Five Guys, Virgin yep. Media, um, Cafe Nero, but also smaller brands that um, that people ne- wouldn't necessarily have heard of as household names, but are, you know, successful in their own right, um, and charities. So the work that we do is quite varied. Um, but we, you know, we're a bespoke agency, so we we work with each client on a one-to-one basis. Um, and like you said, you know, our, our, our name is Saving Grace and that is what we're there to do. We're there to be the Saving Grace, whether it's because you can't be bothered to organise an event, or you don't have the inspiration, um, or you don't have the resources, or you just want support. Um, that's what we're there to do. So if you are a corporate who's fed up with their last supplier, speak to Rebecca and her team and find out what they can do instead. So quick question to Debbie. Debbie, uh, your last thoughts about um, a re- a putting on a really good event. And Rebecca, I always like to do this. Is there anything you want, you want to ask Debbie? I do speak to Debbie nearly every day, Dave. You do know that, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. <laughs> So I, I love the way you handle that diplomatically. That's brilliant, Debbie. Any well, last, other than swearing at you, Debbie. Any, any last comments? Yeah, I've got one question for Debbie. How do you put up with Dave on a day-to-day basis? Well, we work in very different ends of the house, um, and at, we don't really see each other during the day, candidly. Um, no matter where we've worked around the world, we, uh, he works in a certain way, and I do work in a, in a different way. Um, Dave is very structured. Um, he is he is incredibly organised, and his energy is on believable he will just keep going and going like today he'll work right through till 10 o'clock and he hasn't stopped since 10 o'clock this morning um, whereas me I'm a you know I'm very insular so I need to go and hide away and so I'll probably want to do maybe the most I'll do is two face-to-face coaching sessions so I think we're just very very different and I think that's why it works <laughs> because very, if we're I'm, the same I'm, I'm very structured. you are very I'm good very though stru- he is that's he is, he, he is he's, <laughs> and he's very talented at what he does. He's very annoying, Rebecca, but uh, part of that annoyance is that there's a huge intelligence and intellect in there. And he, Blended know, with a little bit of stupidity. Yeah, and he's brilliant at what he does. So that kind of compensates, and he is really good fun to be around. Yeah, I mean, we've known each other a long time, and I've I've, enjoyed, I've always enjoyed working with him. So, uh, and can I also say he's got the funniest bird head in the world? Uh, I'm gonna have to take it. So we went for this long what hike at the weekend, and he's actually got two sunglasses 
some like <laughs> white patches on the top of his head. <laughs> yeah, so that's the joy I get, Rebecca. He just yes. does some random stuff that you just couldn't ever predict. Now, uh, three quick things to summarise that will leave you business this episode of Say the Greatest Events, and they are number one, if you've got an event, then do contact Rebecca. If you want to come to our event, number two, RLC's virtual event, about starting your recovery plan. Look at the link below. Register your place to be with us right now. And more importantly, whatever you're doing, COVID is not an excuse for non world class events or world class experiences. So if you're running a company, whatever size it is, think about how you can engage them, how you can put on your best self and keep your story going. We've been Double D do business, you've been Debbie Holes Evans. Thank you, Rebecca Hardley. You're welcome. Very great event. Every success with